Hey, it's Tony from Adafruit and I'm back with some awesome content and in this video I want to look at a talk that I gave at World Maker Fair and Seattle Mini Maker Fair. I figured I would just do another run of that talk since I'm not sure it was recorded and I ran into some technical difficulties with the talk so we can do a nice clean run through uh, in this video. And the talk is called Make with Python and so it's about how to make interesting things like maybe blink some lights or read some switches using Python. And it's just a really quick 20 minute or so overview where I really just hope to get the point across that Python is an interesting programming language for makers and maybe what makes it interesting and then what hardware is out there that supports Python. Uh, so we'll kind of dive in here and I'm wearing some fun stuff. Uh, this will actually be used in the demos in a moment here. So this is all Python controlled hardware and we'll see why Python is pretty cool and what some of the advantages are uh, and how you can actually control some of this stuff in real time with Python. So let's just switch to my laptop here as if I'm uh, presenting this for real. So if we look there, okay, there we go. And we'll, we'll keep me in the upper right hand corner here. And then uh, let's dive into this. So like I said, I gave this talk at the Seattle Mini Maker Fair, uh, World Maker Fair in New York. Uh, it's been a busy couple of months. Uh, I had a lot of travel, climbed some mountains, did a lot of fun stuff, uh, but I'm back with some good content now. And uh, like I said, this talk is about what you can do with Python. Uh, so I'm not gonna teach Python in this talk, but I have a lot of good links to uh, learn about Python and like how to get started with it. Uh, so let's just dive in then. A little bit about me, uh, if you're watching this, you might know about me, maybe you don't. I'm an engineer for Adafruit Industries. Uh, we create hardware that makes electronics accessible. So we build all kinds of fun boards, um, like the ones that I'm wearing right here. This is a circuit playground and a little uh, uh, ring of NeoPixels around it. Uh, and these boards are really easy to program and get started with because Adafruit creates really excellent hardware and then really excellent guides and tutorials that explain how to use that hardware. Uh, and so in this talk, I'm gonna talk about hardware that can run Python code and just what is Python code and why is it interesting and why you might wanna look at it. So let's see. First though, let's just dive into a demo. Uh, when I did this originally, the Seattle Mini Maker Fair, uh, actually that one went flawlessly, but the World Maker Fair version of this one, I remember my computer overheated at some point during the demos. So it's good to just go in straight for the demo. Now I'm wearing two things. Um, on the right here is, this is actually a NeoPixel shield uh, that's made for Arduino, but I've just uh, soldered a feather onto the back of it. You might be able to see right here. So there's a Feather M0 Express. And like I said, it's running Python, and we're gonna talk more about what version of Python and how uh, that works. But I'm gonna plug this into my computer here with a serial cable, just a, or a USB cable, actually. Uh, and so now it's connected to my laptop, and let's just jump out of Keynote real fast. And this is the cool thing. So. It's Python code that's running on this board. It's being interpreted in real time. This is much different than if you've ever used Arduino, where you write your code and then you have to upload it to your board. And once it's there, you can't change it without changing the code and re-uploading it. Whereas with these Python boards that uh, use this interpreted language that we'll talk more about, it's actually pretty cool because you can edit the code directly on this chip, change the code and see the change happen. And so I'll demo that real fast. In Finder here, uh, I get a drive that's called CircuitPython. And these are actually all of the files that are on this board right here. So this is not on my computer. This is on this board. Um, and if I want, I can take this main.py file right here and drag it into a text editor right here. And this is the code that's running on this board right now. Uh, and I have some kind of variables at the top here that I can easily change. You can tell I went to a Blade Runner themed party and I was wearing this. Uh, I have a, a good quote from the original Blade Runner movie. But let's just change something. Let's, uh, let's change the quote. Uh, so maybe Blade Runner doesn't apply anymore. We'll say uh, Python is awesome. And then uh, let's change the color. So 
colors, usually computers represent them with three values, a red, green, and blue intensity. And so in this case, there are three numbers here, 255, 0, and 180. That's your red, green, blue intensity values. Uh, so if I want to change the color to green, then I want 0 red. I want 255 green because that's the maximum green intensity. It's kind of an esoteric computery reason why you use numbers from 0 to 255. It's a byte value. Uh, but it just means that that's the maximum green color. And then I want 0 blue color. So this is just pure green. Uh, and like I said, we change the message here. There's some other stuff you can change, like how fast the message scrolls. Uh, and then below this, we'll look at this in a second, but that's the code. But what I'm gonna do is just say, save this file, and let's see what happens. So I just saved that, and notice this, it just changed. It's now green, and it says Python is awesome. So cool, we just changed the behavior here by editing this source file. I didn't have to upload, I didn't have to run a tool like Arduino. I'm actually just using this text editor. This is called the Atom text editor, kind of an advanced text editor. You can use really any text editor on your computer. Uh, but you know, just to prove that this is real, like let's change this to a different color. Let's say about maximum green and blue. So green and blue, I think that's gonna give me yellow. Let's see what happens. So I'm gonna press uh, Command S. That's just the shortcut to save. So I'll do that and I save it. And oh, it's a cyan color that I get. So you see it changed the color. Uh, and it's kind of a neat cyan, but still scrolling the message across. And so that's the power of Python. It's an interpreted language. The code is actually run on the fly, which means you can change the code really easily and then change the behavior of your device. And we'll look at some more advantages and uh, interesting reasons why you might want to use Python. But this is really cool because again, this is all Python code. And if I scroll down here, you can see this is the Python code that's powering this. Um, I'm not going to explain how all of this works. Um, you know, I'm just giving you an overview of, type of uh, Python in this talk. But this is not that complex in the sense that, you know, if you look at this, it, it's English, right? Like you can kind of read what some of this means. Um, there are some of these things called comments right here that explain maybe what's happening online. Um, but you can see like, okay, we're maybe creating a variable called button first and we're reading some button value and we're filling the pixels. Um, so, you know, I just want to get the point across that Python is a little bit simpler of a language. If you've used something like Arduino, you see a lot of like curly braces and sometimes some more advanced kind of usage of uh, managing memory and things like that. A lot of that kind of goes away with Python. Like it's all made to be very easy to read and to understand. Uh, okay, so let's dive back into the talk um, after that demo. So like I said, what is Python? Uh, well, Python is a programming language. Uh, what's a programming language? So you might not even know uh, what is a programming language, and that's that's okay because programming language is just something that tells a computer what to do. So in our world, you know, we love devices like um, Amazon's Echo or maybe your Google phones where you can just talk to them or Siri, you know, hey Siri, what's the weather today? Uh, and you can ask it a question and it will respond. But the chip inside of your computer doesn't understand language like that. Um, it would be great if we could just tell our computer, hey, you know, sort these emails and give me the, the most important ones or whatever, but we're not there yet, we're getting close. Uh, but in, so in order to do that kind of work, like sort through your emails or whatever, you actually have to write code that's in a programming language, that's a special language that your computer understands. And sometimes that language looks sort of like English, but in a lot of cases, that language is built more for the computer to understand it and less for you as the user to understand it. So you're not gonna speak to your friend in a programming language, uh, typically, although you could if you have some very special friends, uh, but you're usually probably not gonna talk in a programming language. Uh, you're only gonna talk to a computer in a programming language. And Python is one of many programming languages. Uh, so you might wonder like, why are there multiple programming languages? Isn't, isn't one just good enough? And it turns out that each programming language has certain disadvantages and advantages. You know, it's, um, I think of an analogy uh, of tools. So if you're trying to screw a screw into the wall, you probably don't want to use a hammer. Uh, it might work if you pound it enough, uh, you might be able to jam the screw in there and you might completely mess up the threads and you'll never get the screw back out. Um, but you probably want to use a screwdriver because that's the tool that's intended to screw the screw into the wall. Uh, so that's the same idea with programming languages. Each one is kind of good and maybe bad at certain things. There's no perfect programming language that you'll just write every bit of code in uh, because in some cases you need to use really advanced programming languages that talk to your processor at a really low level uh, and those might be more difficult to use and maybe uh, less friendly. 
Uh, whereas in other cases, you're just doing something uh, that's less resource intensive. Maybe you're talking to a web service to figure out what the weather is. And so you can use a more uh, simpler and friendly programming language, or maybe one that's more optimized to talk to web services like JavaScript or Python or something like that. Uh, so the point I want to get across here is that there are lots of programming languages and don't be afraid of them or think like, oh, well, I only need to learn one and that's it and I'm, I'm done. Uh, it actually, it's actually good to learn a lot of different programming languages and Python is one of many programming languages. Uh, so you might kind of wonder, oh, and actually just to go back to, uh, Python has some advantages and disadvantages compared to other programming languages. So the big advantage of Python is that it has a focus on readability which means that it's meant to be easy to read. So you as a programmer can look at the Python code and follow it by just naturally following the language. Uh, and this was really from the beginning of Python, something that they intended to be a priority for the language. Uh, other languages, maybe readability is less of a concern. Uh, and so they can be a little harder to understand. And so the readability as a primary factor in Python's development has helped make it easier for beginners to get started with. Uh, so it makes it easier to kind of understand what your code is supposed to do. And you might wonder like, oh, well, who cares about readability? I'm going to write my code and it's going to be perfect. And who cares if anyone else reads it? Uh, but don't be so confident because you're probably going to end up reading your code maybe many years later from now. And you'll thank yourself if you write it in a way that you can understand it and read it again, because trust me, you'll forget exactly what happens. And many times I've been staring at code wondering, what in the world did this person do only to realize that, oh, that was me like four or five years ago uh, that did that. Uh, we also say that Python is batteries included, and that's because Python includes a lot of code that you can use uh, yourself. So for example, if you're talking to a web service, or maybe if you're talking to certain files on your computer, like reading a bitmap image, there are libraries that are already written in Python that you can import and use that code so you don't have to write it, which is a huge advantage. Uh, it makes things a lot easier. It's a lot faster to build an interesting project because you can just pull in all these great resources that are already available. And Python has a huge community. Uh, I'm sure they have, I would guess, well over tens of thousands of packages of libraries of code that you can pull in uh, and use yourself. So it's great to have that. And batteries included also kind of represents that when you download and when you install Python on your computer, it comes with a lot of libraries by default. So things like manipulating the files on your computer or talking to basic web services, all that's built into Python. So you download it, you get all of that, and then you can add on more features to it also. Um, it's an interpreted language, like I mentioned. And so that means that the code actually runs on the microprocessor. There's this extra step where it has to convert that Python code that you saw earlier that looks a little bit like English, it has to convert that into code that can run on your little board. And even, even your main computer, actually, uh, your, the chip in your computer or your laptop or your tablet or whatever you're viewing this on, it doesn't speak Python natively, at least not yet. Uh, so you need to do this conversion step to take your Python code and convert it into code that your processor understands. And usually that code is a lot lower level, a little bit harder to, uh, for a human to write because it's not meant to be something that humans typically write. We've built all these tools uh, that can actually convert programming languages into that uh, machine language. And so that's this extra step with an interpreted language. Now this is different from something like Arduino, if you use the platform like Arduino, where this interpretation step doesn't happen because ahead of time in Arduino, you write your sketch and you, when you press upload, there's actually an extra step that happens kind of underneath the, the covers or behind the scenes where it's compiling that code and it's doing that conversion from the high level language, the Arduino code into the machine code. So with Arduino, it does that when you press upload or there's actually a compile button, but it does that ahead of time. And that's why your code is fixed and it can't change. Now it is nice in that that code is optimized and fast and it's as fast as the hardware can run it because when, you're, when you load your Arduino code onto your board, it's just gonna directly run that machine level code that's already been converted ahead of time. Whereas with some of these Python boards and, some, and running Python in general, you always have to have that extra step to convert from Python into your machine code, which takes a little bit of extra time, uh, might take more memory and more resources. 
but you might see that that probably doesn't matter. Um, you know, the processors and chips these days are getting so fast and have so much memory that having a little bit of extra overhead for that isn't that critical. And when you really do need to get down to the bare metal and access hardware at a super low level, there are ways to do that. It's a little more advanced, but uh, it can make it accessible. So for this hardware that I'm wearing, for example, uh, the NeoPixels that are being lit up, the, that's actually not Python code that's lighting up the NeoPixels. It's actually code that's written in uh, that a higher level language that was compiled into machine code. But the actual code that's scrolling the message and it's actually doing the animations and figuring out the colors and things like that, all of that's Python code. So that code doesn't need to be very fast. You know, it's just updating maybe 10 times a second. Uh, whereas the NeoPixel code that lights up the colors of all the individual LEDs on here, that does have to be really fast. And so there are ways that you can mix both compiled and interpreted code like Python and get the advantages of both. So that, you, as you saw, the code is really easy to modify for this piece of hardware, uh, but I can still do cool things like light up NeoPixels and animate them. And uh, you can see this is my arc reactor right here. So this thing's pulsing and flashing all kinds of different colors. And um, the last really interesting thing about Python is that because it's interpreted, um, you can actually execute Python code on the fly. So at, uh, when I connected this to my uh, computer, this board right here, it actually shows up as a serial device. And we'll look at a demo in a little bit where I can connect and I can tell this board what Python code to run. And that's really powerful. We call that a REPL or a read, evaluate, print loop, uh, which is a kind of weird Pythonic name. Uh, but basically a REPL is a Python prompt where you can just run Python code. And there's no analog like that in the Arduino world. And that's why I think this is really interesting and why Python boards and using Python in your maker project is pretty cool and interesting. Even if you're just learning, um, you can get to a Python prompt, start running code and see the results immediately. Uh, so you can see like uh, the, if, if the pixels light up a different color or if you're reading a button, you know, maybe you can flip the button and read it again and see how it changes. So it makes it a lot easier because you don't have to do all these extra steps of writing a complete sketch, uploading it, seeing the results, realizing it was probably wrong, changing it, uploading it, you know, going through that whole process. Instead, you just connect to your board, run some Python code and see what happens with it. So it's really powerful and something super useful for beginners because you don't need to learn about what is the, the tool to upload, what is a sketch, what goes into a sketch. You can just connect and just start running Python code and experimenting with it. The worst thing that happens is it just gives you an error message. Uh, you know, it's something not to be afraid of. It's very, very hard to break these boards uh, when you're running different code on them. So, okay, so let's keep going here. Uh, another reason why you might want to use Python is that it's everywhere. So I guarantee whatever device you're viewing this on, there's a way to run Python on it. Uh, it's available on all your desktop machines. So Mac, Windows, Linux, that's kind of the primary platform for Python. Uh, it's available on mobile devices. So Android, iOS, there are some really interesting Python apps. Uh, Pythonista on iOS and QPython on Android give you a little Python terminal that you can run, you can type in Python code and run it. That's super useful for learning. So you can learn the core Python language and maybe just practice a little bit. You know, if you're on the bus or you're traveling or whatever and you have your tablet, you can just start playing with some Python code and seeing the results directly uh, from some of those apps. Uh, there's even Python in the browser. So you can go to pythonanywhere.com. That will take Python code that you type in, go run it on a server somewhere, and then send you back the results. So it's kind of cool for maybe server side processing or things like that. Uh, and then another one is this Sculpt, sculpt.org, which is actually a Python interpreter that runs in your web browser in JavaScript entirely. Um, it has a few more limitations compared to some of the other Python implementations, but it's still pretty cool. Like you can just open your phone, go to sculpt.org and start typing in Python and you will see the results. Again, it's great if you're learning, if you're following like a book that's kind of getting started thing and you just wanna see like, okay, what does this function or thing do? Try it out, see what happens. You know, Python runs anywhere. Uh, and does it run on hardware? Well, obviously it does because I'm running some, uh, some hardware right here that's Python powered. And so we'll talk more about that in this talk. And the last kind of final point about why you might wanna use Python is that it's really easy to learn. And so this comes back to uh, readability being a priority. Uh, Python was just meant to be a more friendly language for a beginner to pick up. And it's been around for quite a while. I think it's over 25 years old. So there is a lot of uh, information out there about how to learn Python. And I just listed a few good resources here 
um, in these slides. So the Hitchhiker's Guide to Python is kind of a community curated list of really good Python content. They have a Learn Python section that I highly recommend checking out. It kind of has an up-to-date list of what are the good books and resources. Um, there are lots of free resources also to learn Python. And then I listed two courses. So Code Academy and Google have courses online. Both are free. Uh, and these are kind of video courses that walk you through learning the Python language. And these are focusing more on beginners, so someone who might not have programmed yet. Um, it will take you from the basics to learning about Python and understanding the syntax. Uh, because one important thing to understand is that Python, the language, is pretty universal. So the same Python that you type into your phone, uh, that you run on this hardware here, that you run on your computer, that core language is the same. So if you learn it on your computer, then you can also use that same Python code uh, typically on your hardware like this. Some of the functions and things you call might be different, uh, but learning the basics about Python is going to apply to everything. Uh, and then I also mentioned a couple books, so Automate the Boring Stuff with Python and Invent Your Own Computer Games with Python are both excellent books. Uh, that look at how to do things like manage um, you know, files on your computer or build computer games and things. And again, both these are targeted at beginners. Uh, but if you're not a beginner, if you're a little more advanced um, or if you're a student, like maybe a high school or college student, and you're thinking about going into computer science, uh, Python is a powerful language that's used everywhere. Um, and it's so powerful that actually MIT, they use uh, Python in their introductory to computer science courses. So you can actually see the MIT 6.00.1x course, uh, and I believe that course is actually free online, or at least all the content from that course is online. So why not check it out if you're getting more serious about computer science? You know, if it's good enough for MIT, then it's probably good enough for you. Uh, and again, it's all Python that you can learn from that. Uh, okay, so Python on hardware. So Python runs on your computer. You can install Python on your Mac, your Windows, your desktop, um, your Linux machine. And it lets you talk to the files and things on your computer and even some of the hardware connected to it, like you can connect a webcam or you know, your keyboard or joystick or something like that and read that. Uh, but you can also talk to hardware that's more interesting to the maker community. So there's something called Fermata, which is a special firmware that you can load onto an Arduino board. And then with that firmware, you can connect it to your computer and then Python code on your computer can tell your Arduino board what to do. So you might imagine if this little message scroller was an Arduino board, you know, it could be connected to my computer through this cable, and then my computer could be telling the special Fermata firmware on this device, okay, light up the pixel this color. Uh, and then maybe the Python code on my computer recomputes, you know, okay, now the animation changes, and now light up this color. Uh, so again, it's Python, but it's running on your computer, and then it's telling your hardware what to do. And so the disadvantage there is that as soon as you disconnect the, your hardware from your computer, you've disconnected the brain. So the Python on your computer can't talk to your hardware anymore. Your hardware stops. Uh, it, it's not going to run anymore. Uh, so it's a little more limited like that, but it's still great in some interesting cases. You know, if you want to hook up some LEDs and maybe light them up from your computer, like show, you know, maybe you're monitoring the status of a bunch of servers or something like that, you can load the Fermata firmware onto your Arduino. It can control things like NeoPixels, and you can do that all from Python. There are a bunch of Python libraries you can use. Again, batteries included. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. You just search for a package. PyMata is the name of a really good Fermata package that you can use. Uh, check out fermata.org. That has more information on the Fermata firmware. Uh, you can also run Python on small computers. So I say small computers because these are a single board computers like the Raspberry Pi or the BeagleBone Black where they're tiny computers that run typically a version of the Linux operating system, although some of them run uh, Windows and other operating systems. Uh, and those are pretty powerful and interesting because they're just like your full-size computer or your laptop. You know, they, they're running the full version of Python that has all of the libraries, um, you know, all of the same capabilities as what you can do on your desktop. You can just do on a small little single board computer. And then some of the computers like Raspberry Pi and BeagleBone Black are more interesting because they have this row of headers on them, this uh, G GPIO headers. So you can actually get direct access to the pins on that chip, whereas on your laptop or your desktop computer, um, unfortunately, they don't give you access to those things anymore. They used to long ago. We used to have a parallel port. You could use those, but uh, phase that out. I mean, we don't even have the headphone jack anymore. So hey, I guess we take what we can get these days. Uh, anyways, 
So Python on these small computers, the big thing to know is that it's just the same as Python on your desktop computer. So whatever you can do on your desktop computer, you can do on these small computers uh, within the constraints of the memory and speed of these computers. They're typically a little bit slower, uh, but you also have all the advantages that you can plug in all kinds of cool, fun stuff. And again, there are a lot of libraries that are written that will let you control that hardware without having to write that code for it. And in fact, with Adafruit, we have for pretty much all of our hardware, a Python library out there that'll work with like the Raspberry Pi uh, to talk to things like, you know, our sensors, our breakout boards, all kinds of fun stuff. Uh, and so I just have some examples of some projects that you can build using a Raspberry Pi um, or BeagleBone or one of these small Linux computers. And so in the upper left, for example, that's a little printer that prints out uh, an image that's taken with the camera. Again, it's just Python scripts that are powering this. In the middle top, uh, that was a neat little Minecraft project I did where it uses an NFC tag reader and little papercraft Minecraft blocks. So when you place the block on the reader, it picks that up and it's just Python code running on the Raspberry Pi. It's a little Python library that I wrote that can tell when you place like a dynamite block onto the reader. It'll create one in the Minecraft world or a brick block. It'll create one of those in the Minecraft world. So it's all Python on hardware. Uh, on the upper right hand corner, that's this thing called Freak Show, where it's a, a uh, software defined radio kind of visualization tool. All Python scripts that are powering that. The little user interface, the display, it's all Python code there. Uh, in the lower left, that was this neat little smart kind of status board or notification display project I built where you can uh, take things like maybe server stats or just, you know, I don't know, is, uh, what's, what's the, uh, the, the coffee level maybe or something like that. Anything you can measure and turn it into a physical dashboard with like really visible numbers and you can have dials that are moving. And it's all Python code that's powering this. It's talking to hardware like a motor driver that can control the little um, dial indicator or talking to some of these big LED displays and telling them you know, what number to show there. It's all Python code that's powering that, which is pretty cool. And then in the lower right-hand corner, that was a robot that was all Python powered. So you can get some little add-on boards for Raspberry Pi that give you motor drivers. You plug in some servo motors. There's a beautiful little robot chassis you can put all of this into and then have some Python code running on your Raspberry Pi that controls that robot. So you can tell it to move forward or backwards or you know, turn, do whatever you want. Maybe add some sensors and add a bunch of uh, customizations to it. So there's a lot you can do with Python on these small little computers like this. Um, but what about Python on even smaller computers? Because the Raspberry Pi and the BeagleBone Black are still relatively large. You know, they're credit card size things and they might take a lot of power and resources sometimes. Um, what about like an Arduino board or you know one of these smaller boards like this that I have? Uh, can you run Python on one of those boards? And it turns out, yes, you can. There's a version of Python that's been ported to run on some microcontrollers and it's called MicroPython. It's an excellent open source project uh, created by a man named Damien George. And basically his intention was to take the Python interpreter and make it run in these small, low memory environments like on these little microcontrollers here. Uh, and he's implemented pretty much the full Python language. Um, you know, as a beginner, I doubt you would ever hit any of the edge cases that aren't supported yet. It's really some more of the esoteric advanced features of Python. You know, 99% of the language is there. And I think the goal is eventually to get all of the language supported. Um, but you can do control of your hardware in Python code on these little microcontrollers. And little in the sense of some of these boards only have like 16 kilobytes of memory, which is nothing. You know, the, uh, the thumbnail for this YouTube video is well over 16 kilobytes of data. So it's, uh, you know, just within that space alone, you can have a whole Python interpreter and all kinds of uh, code and things running on here. And again, like I mentioned, it's really cool with MicroPython because you get the, the full Python language and you get that REPL, that read, evaluate, print loop, where you can connect to a board and dynamically run Python code. So you can just experiment and play around and see the results of what happens if you read this button and then you flip the button into another position and then you read it again. You can see that it changes from maybe a high to a low logic level. Or if you wanna turn an LED on, you can just run a command that turns the LED on and see it turn on instantly, which is really super powerful uh, and kind of unique and new. You didn't have that with uh, things like Arduino. Um, and there's also a version of MicroPython that runs on a board called the BBC Microbit, which is a really interesting board that came out in the last couple years. Uh, it's a board that packs both a little microprocessor 
and some sensors and things onto the board. So it has a grid of LEDs that you can scroll a message across. Um, it can play little sound effects out of like a speaker if you connect it. Uh, it has a compass on it, I think an accelerometer and a few other sensors and things. And so it's cool because it's all Python code that you can write that runs on this little board. So you don't even have to solder anything together. You just buy the board. You've already got a little grid of LEDs. You've got some buttons on it. So you've got some interactivity ready to go and it's all Python code. So if you want to write a game, you can just write some Python game code, put it onto this board uh, and you're ready to go. And it's all, uh, all in one. So that's pretty cool. And there's also a version of Python that runs on some of the boards that Adafruit sells. So I have, this is Circuit Playground Express that's in the middle of my arc reactor. And then, like I said, this was a Feather M0 board. So these are boards that have a version of Python called CircuitPython running on them. And CircuitPython is basically MicroPython. We've taken MicroPython uh, and forked it. And we've added support for these extra boards right here. And we're working on kind of simplifying some of the hardware access APIs. So with MicroPython, the big focus is giving you access to the machine at a super low level so that you can have all of the capabilities of your microcontroller. And the boards that MicroPython run on are typically pretty powerful and pretty interesting boards. Um, whereas for some of the boards that Adafruit sells, you know, we have some boards like Circuit Playground Express that maybe don't have as much power, as much uh, capabilities, uh, but have a bunch of cool things built into them like buttons and NeoPixels and an accelerometer. So we want to make this, that really easy for people to use uh, and kind of simplify the API. And so that's why we've taken kind of CircuitPython or taken MicroPython and turned it into something we call CircuitPython so that it can run on these boards and give you a really easy to use uh, programming experience with it. And it looks like my cat is quite interested in, uh, in, this, in these Python boards. Um, anyways, the other interesting thing with CircuitPython is that on these boards um, that use this Feather M0 or the Circuit Playground Express board, uh, boards that use this special chip, this Atmel chip, the SAMD21, they actually show up as a USB drive. And you saw that a moment ago when I plugged this board into my computer, it showed up as a drive that just gave me the code and I could edit that code. And every time I clicked save, it reran the code on this board. So you saw the, the color change dynamically. That's really powerful and really cool because it makes it easy to edit your code. Um, you don't have to install a tool like Arduino and learn how to use it and install all these libraries and things. Just start editing the code and see what happens. Um, and it gives you a really fast kind of workflow for that. So let's see, let's do another demo now. So I'm gonna connect my other board right here. So I'm gonna connect, I'm gonna disconnect this board. And you can see it's still running, which is the cool thing because the Python code is running on this chip. You know, it's not like running on my computer and then my computer disconnects. It's just always running on this board. But I'm gonna plug my arc reactor in now and I'll demonstrate the REPL, the reevaluate print loop. And that's kind of the Python prompt. Okay, so I just plugged this in. And I'm going to go back and I'm in a terminal program because the REPL, it shows up as a serial device. Um, like, uh, boy, I don't even know if there are serial devices that people use these days. Back in my day, we used modems and a modem was a serial device, but I don't know what other than an Arduino, I can't think of a, a modern serial device that you might need to use. Um, but uh, the tool that you can use on a Mac is called Screen, and this will let you connect to a serial device. And it looks all scary and hackery uh, right here because I have this kind of green and black terminal, so you know some serious hacking is happening right now. Uh, but at the end of the day, this any kind of a serial terminal program will work. Uh, you can get a nice graphical one if you want. But I'm going to connect to this dev .usb modem, and on Mac, they give serial devices really funny names sometimes. So it's called USB modem 49 in this case. And then I have to tell it what speed to connect at. This is just kind of boilerplate to open a serial connection. But I do that and okay, nothing happens. Uh-oh, the demo's broken, no. So what's happening here is this code is still running. You can see my arc reactor here is still animating. Uh, and so I don't see anything here because this board is in a loop that's running the Python code right here. But if I press control C, that actually just stopped the code that was running on this board. You can see it just stopped. It's, it lit up red and that was it, it's done. Uh, so I pressed control C to, to tell the Python interpreter, hey, stop running this code and let me get in there and start running my own code. So I'm gonna press the key and now I'm in this REPL where basically any Python code that I type in, um, it will run and give me the result back. So I can say print hello world and that's kind of the most basic Python program, like congratulations, you are a Python programmer if you type that in and get that result. So what happened here was 
I typed in print hello world on my computer. It sent that Python instruction to my arc reactor right here, or the chip that's running on here. Um, and then it ran that, uh, that code, print hello world. It got a result back, it said hello world, and it sent that result back through this cable to my computer. So again, it's not Python running on my computer, it's Python running on this device and just giving me the result back right here. Um, so that's kind of cool. And you can do a lot with Python on here. I mean, you get a calculator, it's like one plus one equals two. You can run any kind of Python code in this prompt. Um, but let's import some code that I wrote ahead of time. So I wrote some code that makes it easier for me to control the lights on this arc reactor. Uh, and this is a powerful feature of Python. You can write code, you can save it onto your board, you can import that code later so that you don't have to write it again or um, you know, reinvent it. It will just be saved on your board and you can use it again. So I'm gonna run a command called import arc reactor. And arc reactor is the name of the code that I wrote ahead of time that gives me some control over this board. Um, there's another module I wrote ahead of time called color, and that gives me a bunch of colors that are uh, more friendly. So you saw earlier how I had to change the, the number for each color from like zero to 255. Uh, I, I created some colors that I can identify by name. Uh, and actually I can list all of those with this dir command. It lists all of the things in a module. So you can see I have colors in here like violet, green, indigo, uh, orange, blue. So these are more friendly names that I can reference. Um, and in this arc reactor module that I created ahead of time, I added some functions to it. So I, there's a function called color. So when I type in arc reactor .color, I need to tell it what color I want it to light up. So I can say from that color module, um, let's say purple. So I do that. And this is a valid Python command right here. It's gonna call a function in that arc reactor module and it's gonna pass it a color to change. So watch what happens when I press enter. I do that and oh, uh oh, name purple is not defined. Let's see, what did I do wrong here? Oh, I think I put a comma instead of a, uh, a period right there. So yep, there we go. So this is also another advantage of Python. Um, maybe I meant to do this. When you get something wrong, the worst that happens is you get an error message. So it told me, hey, purple is not defined. It was trying to run the, my code, but it didn't know how to run it because I wrote it in the wrong way. Uh, so this is super powerful and useful in that you get that immediate feedback. You know, oh, that line that I just typed in, something was wrong with it. So I should go back and look and see. And then I notice, oh, I have a comma instead of a period right there. So now let's try this. So I do that. And hey, check that out. It just instantly lit up purple. That's pretty cool. Uh, you know, I typed in the Python command. It got sent to this board. It interpreted it. It ran the functions that I wrote uh, that lit up the board. And I can change the color if I want. I can say arc reactor dot color, let's say color dot orange. Uh, and I do that and you get kind of a yellowish, orangish kind of color like that. That's pretty cool. I also have a clear function. And so this will just turn off the arc reactor. So I can just, I can turn on a color and turn it off a color. Um, now there's a few other things I put in this arc reactor module because on this circuit playground uh, express board, there are two buttons. There's a push button uh, and I can press these buttons and I can actually read these buttons from Python. So uh, in my arc reactor module, I have a, uh, let's see, when I press tab, it kind of gives me a list of all of the things inside of that module, which is again, another really cool thing that uh, Python does. And if I call this button B uh, dot value, so this is basically gonna read a property on this button B object. And this is gonna tell me if that button is pressed or not. So I'm gonna, I, I ran that command, it returned a result of false. So the way buttons work in Python, uh, or the way a lot of these uh, button values work, they're called a Boolean value, which means it's either true or false. It's never anything in between. The button is either pressed when it's true, or it's not pressed when it's false. So you can see it told me false, and that's because I'm not pressing the button. And I can run that again, I'm gonna get false again. But if I press button B, which is this one right here, so I'm gonna press it and hold it down, and I run this function again, now I get true. That's pretty cool, I get true. But if I let go, I get false again. So that's how I can read this button and change my behavior. Uh, based on that, I can just write some code that reads that button B value. And if it's true, do one thing. If it's false, do another thing. Um, so let's do that. I'll write real fast, just some Python code. Uh, I'm gonna run this in a loop. So this is called a, a while loop. And this basically just means run this code forever. So I'm gonna always be reading my button. And when I detect a press of that button B, maybe I'll light up a certain color. And when I don't see a press of that button, I'll clear the colors. So let's just say if 
uh, arc reactor dot button b dot value. Uh, so if this is true, then let's light up a certain color. Let's say arc reactor dot color color dot uh, how about fuchsia. And then I can say if I'm not pressing that button, so this else clause is a special thing in Python. I'll talk more in a second about this. Uh, let's just run arc reactor dot clear. So when that button B value is false, when I'm not pressing the button, it's going to run this little line of code. And so this is Python code that I just typed in here. And you can see it's kind of like English, right? While something is true, so it's just going to do something forever. So while this is true, um, if arc reactor button B dot value is true, it's kind of an implicit thing that Python will check here. If that's true, then call arc reactor dot color color dot fuchsia. So set the arc reactor to a fuchsia color. Else, so if my button B value is false, if it's not true, that's you know the only other possible state for it, then clear it, turn it off basically. So I'll, I'll do that, and then I have to tell this that I'm done typing in this loop by basically just getting rid of all these extra spaces that it adds. And okay, so now it's running and it's doing nothing. Uh-oh, is it broken? Well, here's the big test. I'm gonna press button B and let's see what happens here. So I press button B, hey, it lit up fuchsia. And if I let go, it turns off. And if I press it again, it lights up and then it goes off when I let go. So, so that's pretty cool. And you can see that's exactly what's happening here with the code. You know, when I press this down, that button B dot value is true. And so every time it's running through this loop, it sees that button B is true, it lights up the color of the pixels fuchsia, and then as soon as I let go, this check will be false now. This button B value is false, and it's gonna fall down to this else clause to say, okay, clear the colors of this arc reactor. Uh, so this is pretty cool, and that I was able to just type in this little loop, and suddenly I've changed the functionality of this board. Um, and if I wanted to, I could actually save this code into a file like you saw earlier, that main.py file. That's the main Python code that's running on this board. I could save that onto my arc reactor right here. And now my arc reactor, every time I load it up and, and connect the battery, it would uh, you know blink itself fuchsia like that. So really cool and powerful. And again, this kind of demonstrates the, the power of having that REPL or that read evaluate print loop uh, in your Python code here. So, okay, that was it as far as the demo goes. And then uh, just if for uh, you know reference, if you wanna learn more, uh, definitely check out python.org and the Hitchhiker's Guide to Python, like I mentioned. Uh, MicroPython, micropython.org, that's kind of the main page for all of uh, the MicroPython info. And then uh, for CircuitPython, check out Discord. So discord.gg slash Adafruit. Uh, there's a whole community there of uh, kind of an online chat system but there's a CircuitPython channel that you can check out uh, and get lots of good info there on, uh, on using CircuitPython. Uh, and then also check out learn.adafruit.com, the Adafruit learning system. There's a whole category for CircuitPython projects. Uh, and if you get a board like Circuit Playground Express or some of these Feather M0 Expresses and things, uh, look at the guide for that, hard, for that project or for that uh, piece of hardware and you'll see for all the CircuitPython compatible boards now, we have instructions on how to load CircuitPython if your board doesn't ship with it. Uh, what you can do, some of the basic uh, simple little examples of like reading a button or maybe uh, controlling an LED are in there. So definitely check out those resources. Uh, and then if you want the slides for this, uh, check out bit.ly slash makePython. And so that'll give you the slides. Uh, and really the most interesting slide, especially if you're a beginner, is probably this one about uh, why you might want to use Python and links to some really good Python uh, learning resources. And like I mentioned, you know, you can learn Python on your computer and that same basic syntax and code will apply to Python on hardware like this. Uh, so like that while loop and that if uh, conditional, that's all the same. You can run that same code on your computer, you know, lighting up the NeoPixels. Okay, maybe you won't run that exact same code on your computer, um, but the basic idea of calling a function like that is the same. So you can learn Python on your computer and then apply all of that to uh, your hardware there. So that's it. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think there'll be any questions since this is uh, recorded ahead of time. So uh, unless my cat has a question, although she's in, the, in her box right now. Uh, so anyways, I'll wrap this up then. This was Make with Python. This was a uh, recording I wanted to make of a talk that I did at World Maker Fair, Seattle Mini Maker Fair, and I'm sure I'll probably end up doing it at some uh, other uh, interesting maker events in the near future. Uh, anyways, so check out youtube.com slash Adafruit. You can see this video and all kinds of other fun project videos there. Uh, and like I mentioned also, check out discord.gg slash Adafruit. That's where you can see Adafruit's Discord community. Uh, we're basically trying to build a more welcoming community for folks that want to play with hardware. 
Uh, so check all that out. Uh, and until next time, this is Tony from Adafruit. So thanks for watching. I'll see you later. Bye.